Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Scary Things Found in Family Friendly Games. Hey, it's me, Gambito Gaming. It's been a couple months since I've uh, touched this topic. I guess I could still label this as an iceberg, but most of these entries were sourced from you guys on the last videos from the comment section, and also some entries I researched and sourced myself. So this doesn't come from an iceberg over on Reddit or icebergcharts.com or something like that, like I would usually do, but I found it to be such an interesting topic, I did want to cover some more instances of it. So today we're going to do just that, guys. We're, we're diving way deep back in. If you want to leave your scary experience with a kid's game in the comments, I will include it into a future video if it's good enough. I I think there's a lot of examples out there and I'll keep doing videos on this subject as long as there's good enough entries out there. So uh, anyway, let's go ahead and hop into even more scary things found in family friendly games. Distance is a fast-paced cyberpunk-esque racing game that takes players through some pretty wild environments from what I've seen. One of the craziest levels is known as the Abyss, and it seems to come out of nowhere in the game's progression. For most of the game, you know, you're driving through these futuristic environments that you'd see like in your standard like Ghost Runner game or something like that. However, when you get to a level known as the Abyss, things start to get a little strange. Ooh, the Abyss, it's like rock bottom, ooh. As you start through the level, you'll automatically notice a shift in tone that the game is presenting. Instead of the fast-paced, action-packed environments you're usually driving through, the Abyss rather is more comparable to those dash cam videos you see on YouTube sometimes where someone's driving through a dirt road in the woods at night and the only light is coming from the car's headlights. I fucking hate those videos. As the level progresses, things get stranger and stranger as Slenderman-esque visual defects start taking over as you continue to drive your way down this, this horrid level. As you drive deeper, you realize just the full extent of the mindfuck that's going on here. You just thought this was a silly driving game, didn't you? You are expected to make daring leaps of faith into complete darkness, past signs that clearly read no entry, and drive down some of the darkest and smallest tunnels I've ever seen in a driving game. The level ends in a fever dream where everything seems like a mirage led on by these small marker-like structures throughout the levels. Like, come on, how are these not the markers from Dead Space? The ending of the level is best I can describe to you as a car experiencing ascension. If you like these type of games like maybe Thumper or Fast Racing Neo, this one seems like a great double A racing game that has some unique bits, especially since the Abyss is only like the third or fourth level in. So God only knows what the rest of the game holds. I, I, I do think this is the scariest level in the game, but regardless. Uh, thanks for the suggestion. A Hat in Time is one of the first feats in resurrecting the 3D platformer of yesteryears. The game's main inspiration is Super Mario 64, which is my favorite game ever made, so I must love this game, right? I must be beaming at the scenes to talk about this one. Well, I haven't beaten the game. Alright, I'm not the biggest fan of the art style, and some of the more gimmicky levels aren't my favorite in the game, which is really kind of why I haven't seen it all the way through, but it's definitely on my backlog. Because for what the game does, I do really love it, like the tight controls, it makes me want to see the full game through, it's just, I haven't. Apparently in the later levels of the game, there is a stage in which the game's happy and cheery style turns itself on its head and gets pretty disturbing pretty quickly. Okay, maybe not disturbing, but definitely creepy, alright? The level has Hat Kid going into Queen Vanessa's manner, and your objective is to find all the keys and escape before Vanessa gets you. She's coming to get you. Ooh, old Vanessa. Ooh, old Vanessa, and she's coming to get you. Unfortunately, the keys are set up in pretty precarious ways, so in order to get them, you have to make a lot of noise, which in turn draws Queen Vanessa towards you. <laughs> The level is equipped with hiding spots and overall, at best, this feels like an alien isolation mission where your main objective is to just survive, and at worst it resembles that granny mobile game. Either is actually fire to be honest, both of those are great examples of horror done right in my opinion, even granny, but I actually get this weird nostalgia burst when I see this level, even though I've never played it. I think it's because it kind of resembles not only an objective but also the camera angles in the level, those small flash horror games you play back in the day online. The main few that come to my mind is something like Monster Basement or even the Garfield Haunted House games back in the day. Only real ones remember that game. The donut hunting game? Come on. Some dog nuts, bro? What do you mean by that? Regardless, researching this level made me realize I need to give Hat and Time an, a third chance at this point. I, I, I think I'm up to my third playthrough uh, attempt anyway. 
I actually think this comment sums up this level pretty well and it's standing in the game. I like how cute and friendly the game is, like it's just so innocent. Then you get to this level and remember the game is rated T for teen. I gotta say, small things like claw marks on the walls, having to sneak in front of Vanessa while she's in the shower, and having to pop this balloon a thousand times before this key falls, all makes for one of the most unique horror levels I've seen in a 3D platformer. I had a lot of people say in the comments of the last video that I skipped over or even sped through the epic Mickey entry and missed a lot of what makes that game scary not just the clock tower boss battle. So I do want to take the time and make amends with the epic Michael community here today. Sorry guys. One of the biggest L's I took in the last video is not taking a closer look at the game's concept art, which was apparently made to shock Disney during early phases of the game. So when the real more tame version of the game they wanted to make was shown to Disney, it would be easier to sell to them. It was a pretty risky move, but it seemed to work and we got some pretty gnarly concept art out of it. A lot of this puts Mickey Mouse and friends into a Lovecraftian body horror situation and I'm all here for it guys. This really makes me want a Mickey Mouse Souls game, similar to how we got Liza P. And since Mickey Mouse is free from copyright holds now, that could actually happen one day. And I swear, if they don't at least put one of these enemies in the game, I'm gonna fucking riot. We need this weird Abe Lincoln Mickey Mouse centipede creature as a boss in the game, and I won't take anything less. I mean, guys, look, this animatronic Goofy looks like a normal puppet enemy from Liza P. So, I mean, any aspiring game devs out there, please. Anyway, another thing to add to the Glockenspiel boss fight from the last video is the fact that the music that plays over the boss battle is a pretty horrifying rendition of It's a Small World theme. Also that apparently you don't have to paint this guy's face back on, you can actually use the paint thinner in the game and peel this guy's face back layer by layer. Like you're the US interrogating someone who has oil. Yeah, I think a little bit of that concept art ideals made it through into the game after all, guys. While I still think a Soul-style Mickey Mouse game would be pretty dope one day, I do think you can find a lot of dark and eerie things in this game if you dig deep enough. And that's the reason I kind of want to go back and see what it's all about. That and the second one on Wii U? I own both. Why do I own the second one? I never even beat the first one. Where did this come from? Why, why, why do I have this? I'm not a huge Sonic head, but I do know the series has its fair share of eerie and creepy moments. In the second Sonic adventure in the stage leading up to the King Boom Boo, there are these ghosts called Boom Boos, which is kind of funny. Which came first, right? The Boo and Mario or the Boo and Sonic? Listen, I really don't want to add any gas to the old Mario versus Sonic debate fire because the boys have been on good terms recently and I don't want to mess that up, but I'm pretty sure the Boo originated in Mario first. Correct me if I'm wrong down below. Also, it doesn't fucking matter. At the end of the day, they're just names that come from the, what they do, which is scare you. Ooh, Boo. Especially the Sonic Adventure 2 ghost though, because if the competition of Boos was who's scarier, the Boom Boos from Sonic Adventure 2 take the cake all day. There is an enemy version of this character and a boss version, but many find the enemy version to be actually creepier than the boss. This is purely due to the design of the King version being a little less off-putting, but not by that much. Plus, there's some intense moments during that battle that can be ass-clinching at times. The Boom Boo enemies are much more scary than the boss in my opinion, not only based on their visual differences, but based on how they chase the player slowly and menacingly. It also doesn't help that a lot like the Boos in Super Mario 64, these start out much larger than the player, which makes them pretty intimidating when you roll into a room and all of a sudden you're in one of these guys' laps. I gotta say, for never running into these guys, their overall designs give me the same chills something like that banjo Tui fish gave me in the last video. I don't know if it's just their mouth or their teeth or their eyes or something. I think I still like Mario Boos more in general, but if I were choosing one to be more scary, it would definitely be the Sonic Boos. Psychonauts is a series I tried to get into multiple times, most recently around the release of the second game a few years ago. Every time though I sit down with the game, I enjoy my time, but I'm never hooked like I think a lot of other people got with the game. And I'm not sure if it's just the heady theming of the game or the fact I haven't gotten that far into the game to fully appreciate it. And as I see more of the game, I realize it's probably the latter because the entry revealed to me just how dark a kid's game could be. Obviously Psychonauts isn't your traditional kid's game, but with its visual style and 
Pokemon characters, it's safe to assume it was being marketed towards those who liked other kid-themed 3D platformers like Banjo-Kazooie or something. I think for once in one of these icebergs, I'll correctly use the term disturbing and it'll actually hold some weight. I know, I know, I, I, I throw around that word in these videos more than Uncle Phil threw jazz out of that mansion, but this time I mean it. Psychonauts has one of the most dark and disturbing side areas and it has to do with the character known as Mila. From what I remember of the game, the character is usually one of the more upbeat characters in the game, so for her to have one of the darker side stories in the game, it really took a lot of players by surprise. If you aren't familiar with Psychonauts, the basic gist is you go explore people's brains and play out their thoughts, which makes up the levels of the game. Sorry if that was too basic or not all that accurate, but that's what I've gleaned from my short time with the game. Upon entering Mila's mind, you can enter a room where there are drawings of kids and it looks to be a daycare of some sort. After messing around the room a bit, Mila will say not to be there anymore because it's kind of a bummer of a room. You can collect a safe in the room which reveals that Mila used to run or help at an orphanage or something and while she was out at the store, the orphanage burned down, killing all the children inside. Holy shit. After this, if you collect Mila's kids' mind representations in the level, a toy box opens up which Mila will tell the player you definitely don't want to go in there. If you ignore the warning, you roll into a very disturbing part of Mila's mind that shows a ring of fire along with creatures on the outside of it, which I assume are more accurate representations of her children, at least in the darkest parts of her mind. Yikes. The worst part and creepiest part is the loud voice clips of her dead children pleading with Mila for help, and the creepiest part is these voices are so much louder than everything else in the game, even Mila, who is narrating a bit while you're in the room. This probably just represents how loud these voices can be in her head if she doesn't store them away in a dark place of her mind. Jesus, I didn't think we'd been getting on therapy levels of grievance, but we're dealing with the brain here, so I guess, you know, they wanted to explore all their options when making this game. This is by far one of the most disturbing things you can find in a children's game, and considering you don't have to go that far off the beaten path to find it, it makes me realize just how many kids were probably scarred by this after seeing it. Big ups to this person for bringing this one to my attention, because there's no way I would have known about it otherwise. We discussed Rayman 2 briefly in the last video, but I think you guys may have opened my eyes to a much more disturbing part of the Rayman series. This level in Rayman 3 is probably hands down, at least for what the developers were going for, the best horror level in a 3D platformer. I know, that's that's high praise right there, but well, let me talk you through it a little bit. The way it was handled all the way through is honestly super impressive and shocking as an outsider who never even played this game. I watch an extensive retrospective on the level by Hoodoo Hoodlum's Revenge to gather my research for this entry, so shout out to him. It's an entertaining video and goes into a much more detailed raw experience with the level since he played it as a kid, and from what it sounds like, he was scarred by it. So today I will just summarize some of the reasons he stated as to why the stage is the scariest in the Rayman series, and I might venture to say 3D platformers in general. The level is not a traditional scary level that takes place in a haunted mansion or something, but rather takes place in a desert. This doesn't sound all that bad as this is often an unusual suspect for level themes in these types of games, but when you arrive to the desert of the Canaran, you realize you might be in for more than you thought initially. The skybox is hell red, the sand is too hot to step on, and worst of all, there are a bunch of bones littering the desert of some unknown creature that was laid to rest years ago. As Rayman and Globox travel into the canyon of the desert, they save a few of these dudes who warn them that the only way through the desert is through the caves which are filled to the brim with Canaran. The way these guys describe them basically spells out that you shouldn't mess with them and would be better off just avoiding them throughout your little adventure. With that, the game pushes you forward and not too soon after you come across your first Canarin. These guys in this whole segment reminds me of the stealth mission in Wind Waker with the Moblins, but this is that on steroids. Like, holy shit. Your main tactic against these guys is to ring these gongs around the cave to distract them a bit for Rayman to sneak past. And apparently the noise of these gongs is attractive to them because it emits a similar sound to a small creature that they love to torture. So yeah, these Canarins, they don't play around. They're not good people. 
With creepy ambient music surrounding the levels, voice clips that include stick bamboo under his nails, and ending the level off with this segment, where you're cornered on both ends and have to rely on the literal floor giving away underneath you to save you, it's pretty clear as to why this level is creepy to say the least. If you want to see the level in its entirety and get a better perspective as to why the level was creepy to a kid, again, please check out Hoodoo Hoodlum's Revenge's uh, video on the level. We talked a little bit about Super Paper Mario in the last video, but there was a large segment of the game that I was missing and I honestly just forgot about it. I'm pretty sure I remember beating Super Paper Mario when I was younger, and I remember a lot of unsettling stuff in the game, but by far the biggest shock and surprise was the reveal of the villain Mimi's true form. Almost out of nowhere, Mimi will appear to the player after masking herself as a familiar character to Mario and friends, until the true version comes through and reveals the truth. This makes Mimi reveal herself and transform into a giant spider creature right before the player's eyes. The creature's design is most comparable to a daddy long leg in real life due to how tall and skinny the spider's legs stand. The cutscene kind of just ends too when you're expected to hightail it out of the room without much warning. Mimi, or at least a spider form of her, will begin chasing the player if not, and there is a cool little tidbit you can see if you transform into the 3D mode in the game. You can see the inner workings of Mimi, who is a machine with gears and such underneath. This feels like when a Dragon Ball character finally reveals their final form or some shit, and this is definitely one of the creepiest bosses in that game. I think the sheer shock puts this one as one of the scariest moments in the Paper Mario series. Like, I'd say the Thousand Year Door has some pretty eerie moments, things that kind of just linger and make the player feel uncomfortable throughout, which Super Paper Mario also has, but I feel like Super Paper Mario was much better at putting the player in a situation they didn't want to be in, but had no choice to be in. Thanks to the people who unblocked this memory in my head for me, I totally wasn't sleeping fine before I remember this shit existed, so yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure that won't change anything. Much like the arachnophobes with the Mimi boss battle jump scare, there is another phobia that Super Paper Mario tackles. I'd classify this next one as maybe megalophobia, but you could also probably get away with also tacking on thalassophobia with this one. When you enter this water segment of Super Paper Mario, it won't take you long to come across these large tentacles that at first seemed to be just like a level hazard. That is, until you wade your way to the open part of the water and realize that the tentacles actually belong to an oversized blooper you will have to fight. This has got to be the biggest blooper Mario has ever fought, right? I mean, Glooper Blooper from Mario Sunshine was pretty large, but nowhere near this guy. The boss battle involves attacking its tentacles, since homie is too big, he kind of just chills in the back of the screen. Overall, the boss battle isn't that hard, and the giant creature can be taken down with relative ease, but that doesn't lessen the fear some people had when the tentacles would chase them, or when the blooper finally revealed itself. I feel like Super Paper Mario has a lot more creepy stuff lying underneath that I'm just not remembering right now, so please let me know if you guys have anything else worth covering from this game specifically. The level known as Muncher Madness in Donkey Kong Country Returns puts arachnophobes back in the hot seat. This is because the level tasks players with running from a large horde of small little black spiders. And when I say large, I mean banana horde levels of large, dude. The horde is actually set off by a simple action by Donkey Kong, and you're off to the races. I feel like this is kind of how these things would happen in real life too. You unknowingly smash something on the ground, next thing you know a sea of small black spiders comes flooding out. The introduction alone is enough to send a chill down my spine, and I'm not particularly afraid of spiders. Give me something with wings though, it's all over. I'm not laying down my life for anything in my house, they can have that shit. Anyway, the level is an all-out chase throughout, and it reminds me in the best way of the old-school Donkey Kong Country levels where something was chasing you. A nice throwback, but I gotta say this is by far the creepiest version of this level. Once you reach the latter half of the level, you may think you're out of the clear and maybe chill with the little pig checkpoint dude for a minute to catch your breath, but as soon as you step out into the barrel blasting segment, it's back on, baby. Except this time you're running upwards and your only option of getting up is barrel blasting. Hope you guys paid attention in BB101. 
Luckily, I spent many a night ripping my hair out over the older games, so this was no problem for your boy. Once you reach the barrel exit at the top, you'll be kissing the ground like someone whose parachute didn't initially go off in a sky jumping accident. I remember this level from when I first played the game, and the initial shock of a million spiders flooding towards you is something I'm glad I had forgot about since. Once again, thanks to the viewers for bringing this nonsense back up for me. I feel my skin crawling as I'm, as I'm talking about this. Grabbed by the Ghoulies is a rare, rare game I have yet to play, but it's definitely on my backlog, uh, sort of. I'd probably play it on Rare Replay if I were to, but it looks like it has a bunch of rare, rare charm, and it's one of the first games they made after the big Microsoft acquisition. While the game looks more like a video game version of Scooby-Doo, the game actually has some creepy moments hidden within. One of the scariest things in the game is a character known as the Grim Reaper. This is an enemy in the game that cannot be killed and only knocked out. Much like the real-life lore of the Grim Reaper, you can't defeat death, but you can at least knock it off balance, apparently. I think this is the real-life equivalent of probably, like, taking vitamins or staying hydrated or something. Not only is the Grim Reaper enemy undefeatable, but they can one-shot the player and will kill anything in its way to get to the player. It will also almost always beeline it straight towards the player, and it has a pretty fast walking speed, so if you have one on you, you better be moving constantly. It's also worth noting these guys not only change the charming music to wind and weird ambient sounds, but they also suck the color out of the environment in a small radius that surrounds them. I mean, you always gotta go big if you're gonna represent literal death as a character in a game, and I feel like Grab by the Ghoulies did it right with this one. Holy shit. The WWE games for me have become like the UFC games. They're not great games, but at least they achieve some sort of semblance of the real life thing they're trying to simulate. However, back in the day, these games were kind of the shit. I was a kid once, and the plot lines to WWE were simple and fun to follow for a kid, so when the game came out and I could do that but actually fight in it, I was all over that shit. How could I not be? One game in particular that gained a following since its release was WWE SmackDown vs. Raw 2011, which had pretty impressive visuals for the time and still kind of hold up to the, some of the lower end releases of the modern games, but don't tell anybody I said that. Not only that, but the game had a lot of content, and it was kind of before the days of DLC, so the game wasn't played with a bunch of wrestlers you couldn't play as without paying up first. Not only that, but it actually had a mode that allowed players to play as different characters in their road to WrestleMania. In one of these modes, the player has the chance to run across The Undertaker, who in the WWE is known for presenting darker themes of death and stuff of that nature, through the program. Real charming guy we got here. Anyway, if you play as Dolph Ziggler in his road to WrestleMania, you will run across Undertaker's cult. That's the best way I can describe it. There is one particular section where you have to take on a full Royal Rumble, but instead of other wrestlers, all the other fighters are these robed cult members. The whole thing seemingly comes out of left field, and when you look at the rest of the game, this part definitely stands out a little bit. While it's not that scary or disturbing, I think it's still worth a mention just due to the fact that this is without a doubt the scariest thing that'll ever happen in a WWE game. To me, I still think it's more fun killing the clan members in Red Dead 2, but throwing a couple robed freaks out of a ring must be satisfying too on some level, right? This one might be slightly controversial as it's not really all that creepy or really from a kid's game per se, but I think it's still worth talking about. The T-Rex demo for PS1 was one of the most popular demo discs out there because of how impressive it was for the time. While it's literally just a 3D model of a dinosaur walking around, it was still competing with visuals that still look like this. So yeah, this was a little impressive. I've seen some people on the internet and some Reddit threads and other forums say that this demo actually creeped them out as children. I can actually see what they mean, and it's purely due to the fact that this demo takes place with a solid black backdrop. Obviously, the devs didn't want to put any unnecessary time and assets into a background when the main focus was, let's see how clean we can get this T-Rex looking on this system. So it makes sense as to why he comes marching out of darkness, but it's still kind of eerie. My best comparison to something I experienced as a kid was from a game known as Shark Hunting the Great White. The game tasked players with gearing up and going shark hunting. Yeah, this was a little pre-PETA. The game had a lot of different levels you could go on dives in, and almost always the water would be murky and low visibility. This was due to hardware limitations, but it actually lent itself nice to the creepy atmosphere the game was going for. It's really just you and a bunch of sharks you can't see 
right up until they're biting you. That and your ominous breathing sounds, I, I just can't with this fucking game. So I could totally see what some people are saying about this T-Rex in this demo. Much like a shark, if you saw one of these charging at you out of a dark place, it would send more than a chill down your spine, probably a nice clean shit out of your shorts. The T-Rex was so iconic, in fact, it actually showed up as the final boss in the freeware game known as Astro's Playroom on PS5, and it was such a treat to see this guy again, man, looking about how he did back in the day, which just proves uh, how much this demo has aged, but a cool thing to look back on nonetheless. By far the most dark and creepy Harvest Moon, in my opinion, is uh, Wonderful Life on GameCube. The tone of the game and some of the things that happen throughout the game make it the most true to life, but also the darkest. Even with a new coat of paint, this game hasn't lost its eerie charm, it's always had, and one of the things from this game I want to talk about is the ambience the game presents through your everyday life in Forget-Me-Not Valley. The game is full of typical cheery Harvest Moon tracks you come to expect, but there is also just as much silence followed by ambient sounds of nature and the outside world in the game. One spot in particular that is creepy and ominous is the trail leading out of the valley and into the big city. This served as the connection to the Game Boy Advance and this was that part of the game, as the GameCube and Game Boy Advance worked hand in hand for certain games, including A Wonderful Life. The link was basically allowing players to get unique items into the respective games from the other game. For example, the shop owner Van will visit both Forget Me Not Valley and Mineral Town and sell things to the player from each in the, in the other game. It was a pretty cool idea, but made these items hard to get if you didn't have the link cable or even a Game Boy Advance at all. Regardless, today we aren't talking about the link connection, but rather the area right before you walk up the path to Mineral Town in the city. Any music that might have been playing from the nearby farm stops and the players greeted with heavy ambient wind that honestly just makes me want to hightail it and get home. That combined with the menacing climb of the large path and with no sight of what's on the other side makes you really feel like you're leaving the comfort of Forget-Me-Not Valley, maybe for the last time. Since the remake didn't feature any of the connectivity features the original did, the area is just used as a way to skip six hours in the game, but it still does feature the creepy ambient wind sounds that add so much eeriness to the small section of the game. If you want to see the full extent of how dark a Harvest Moon game can get, I recommend checking this game out, even the remake. Although I will say, I would still say if you're trying to fully envelop yourself in the eeriness of the game, the original is still a little bit better to go back to. Not that the remake is bad at all, but the repaint does take a tiny bit of the tone into a more positive direction versus the original, which was more bleak. I don't really know my metric of ranking a gamer if they played Glover or not. Like, I don't know if I should immensely respect you or despise the fact you exist. I unfortunately played this dumbass game that was way too hard for what it was supposed to be. Like, I love Glover for all the charm the game has and for trying something that nobody else was willing to do. I, for good reason, the shit didn't work. Listen, the gameplay sucks, the controls are sluggish, and everything about the game is very frustrating. However, this doesn't stop the game from surprising people here and there. If the scariest thing in the game isn't how shocking bad the controls work, then it's gotta be the overworld. The game starts as you are one of two gloves who gets separated after a wizard accidentally blows up his brew and sends him careening to his own death. Yeah, no, he's dead dead. One of the gloves goes flying into the pot whilst Glover goes flying out the window into the overworld. The glove that fell into the pot emerges as the evil glove known as Cross Stitch, who has one of the most spine-chilling laughs for a kid's game I've ever heard. And don't worry, you'll get real familiar with this laugh, as it happens every fucking time you leave a level. I'm not shitting you here. Not only that, but after this fiasco took place, the surrounding world that was once vibrant and bright is now coated in a hell red skybox and creepy ambient sounds along with the random caw of a crow every once in a while. I get the game wants to portray doom and despair, but this one a little overboard, right? I think a game of this generation that got this turning the overworld into a hellscape thing, right? Was Banjo-Tooie, which shows the doom and gloom of Spiral Mountain after Grunty's reign of hellfire, even down to the burnt corpse of bottles chilling in Banjo's front lawn. See, now that's tasteful. Whatever the hell this Glover shit is doing, though, I mean, are you trying to scar kids or something? 
The ambient sounds of the overworld combined with the sinister laugh of cross-stitch anytime you enter back into the overworld makes this one of the most disturbing home areas in a 3D platformer for me. In the last video, I got some comments about how could I not cover Minecraft, and yeah, it's a good point. There are a lot of eerie and disturbing things in the game, and besides Fortnite, there wasn't another game made for kids as much as this one was. And you're not going to see much scary shit in Fortnite besides maybe this. Don't worry though, I'm not going to be talking about Herobrine or anything like that. I do want to mention though, even though there are some well-known scary things in this game, they're still worth mentioning like uh, the cave sounds and creepy music CDs that have been talked to death on YouTube, but it does add a great deal of the creepy atmosphere to the game. Anyway, today I want to take a closer look at three strange things from Minecraft that aren't talked about as often as say Herobrine is. Hopefully this will quell the Minecraft heads for now and feel free to leave more examples of times Minecraft is scary down below. The zombie villagers in the igloo basements. If you are lucky enough to run across an igloo in Minecraft, you'll definitely want to go inside. There's a strange mystery awaiting the player in the igloo's basement. I know, right? Igloo's basement? I've never heard of an igloo having a full-ass basement. Well, that's exactly what they want you to think, alright? When you go down there, you'll find a trapped villager along with a zombie villager, both caged away. Along with these prisoners, you can find a brewing stand along with a cauldron and some other small items. At the end of the day, this is simply a tutorial area for curing zombie villagers, but the way the game sets it up is a little bit more ominous in my opinion. The fact you stumble across an abandoned igloo in the middle of nowhere and these two chads are just down there freezing to death? Like, who did this and where are they? It's probably a witch, but still, where where is she? You want to know how I know this is fucked up? Alright, imagine this exact same scenario, right? But you're in tall trees in Red Dead 2, and you run across a random igloo in the mountains and you enter it. You find a ladder heading downstairs into the igloo's basement. Then you arrive on the scene of two people in jail, one alive and one, well, unalived. It, it probably wouldn't be the scariest scene in Red Dead 2, but it, it, it would be a contender for sure. The fact is in Minecraft, I mean, come on. The Elder Guardian Jump Scare Perhaps the most random FU moments from developers comes as players make their way towards the ocean monuments in the game. At any moment a random jump scare can happen on the way to the ocean monument where Elder Guardian will wipe itself across the player's screen most likely jump scaring unknown players. A perfect example of this working to 100% efficiency is from this video. Please enjoy, just like I did. I wasn't expecting it and Kevin wasn't expecting it. None of us were. For me. <laughs> the Warden. I can't mention creepy things in Minecraft without mentioning this big behemoth. This is by far one of the creepiest mobs in Minecraft in my opinion. Obviously, he's pretty well known at this point, as he was a huge part of the update he came with, but his presence is still worth mentioning. The absolute Splinter Cell Spec Ops ass mission you have to coordinate with your buddies whenever you go explore the deep dark is reason enough to know why this guy is creepy. But add on to the fact that the Warden is basically unkillable, and the fucking fact he's called the Warden? I mean, how can he not be the scariest mob? That's so badass. I'm not really well versed in Sims lore, so you'll have to bear with me through this entry, but I really do like the Sims games. Sims 2 is one of the best before EA started to piecemeal out everything in the game for DLC, and the game was pretty stacked full of content. The game still saw a decent amount of expansions, but they are expansions that felt like actual expansions on the game, at least back in the day. One of these expansions was the introduction of apartments in the area known as Belladonna Cove. In this area, you can see most of the town from the furthest out camera view there is in the game, but this isn't all the map has to offer. If you zoom out and look in the area in the far corner of the map, you can see a lonesome shack near a river. At first glance, the shack just seems to be some sort of scenery or something maybe, but if you dive into it a bit deeper, the reference is actually a lot darker than you might expect. Using mods or some sort of coding, you can take the camera into a free camera mode and zoom into parts of the map that you'd otherwise not be able to access. By doing this, people have zoomed in closer to the structure and the actual building itself reveals a lot as to what this building might be referencing. I didn't know this since I'm a low-life American, but apparently the legend of the Baba Yaga has a bit more of an origin than just being a nickname for John Wick. We call him Baba Yaga. The headquarters of the Baba Yaga, otherwise known as the Witch in Slavic folklore, is actually a house that has giant chicken legs protruding out of the bottom. 
When we take a closer look at the shack, we can see that two spiral staircases make up the house's legs and supports. But if we take an even closer look, we can see the two footprints that look to resemble chicken footprints. This is a direct reference to the Baba Yaga myth, and it's super interesting that they delved this deep into the lore of the creature to include something like this in the game. If you want a more in-depth look and backstory of the Baba Yaga, check out this video uh, by the YouTuber Sims Lore. The lady who did it says she is Romanian and heard many stories of the Baba Yaga growing up. So if you want someone's perspective like that, definitely go check out that video. In Pokemon Black and White, if you visit the Marvelous Bridge at certain random times, you can run across a pretty disturbing NPC. Depending on if you get lucky enough to see this NPC when you leave to cross the bridge, you may see two NPCs standing looking out over the bridge. At first, it may look like a couple is together or friends or something as they are standing pretty close to each other, and as you approach the group, the girl NPC disappears right before your eyes. It actually happens in-game too as the other NPC reacts by saying, Huh? What? Did she just disappear? Apparently this is just a random occurrence and doesn't have that much significance other than being a creepy moment in the game. You can run across if you're lucky enough or I guess unlucky enough. Man, I love stuff like this as it shouldn't need to be explained, right? It's simply just a ghost girl who hasn't passed on yet and is haunting that bridge. Although it does make you think why it's a bridge though, yikes. There's an interesting theory out there that suggests that this may be an actual person in the game, but her Abra or some other Pokemon teleports her right as you approach. Hey, real quick, it's Gambito After Hours editing this. So I got one thing a little bit wrong here, or I missed a little piece of information. Apparently this old lady inside the room here will tell you about the girl after she disappears, saying she used to spend a lot of time with her Abra there and that she was so full of energy. It's not a full confirmation of this theory about her Abra teleporting her away it doesn't confirm that she's not in fact a ghost but it does kind of add a little bit of weight to that theory uh since this old lady has seen her in the past with her abra messing around on the bridge so maybe there's a little bit more weight to this theory than i initially thought anyway back to the video it's a pretty interesting take but it seems like this is in the game for one thing to be creepy and it definitely succeeds at that Animal Crossing is usually a pretty happy-go-lucky game, right? But sometimes it can get a little dark and despicable, especially late at night. Today, I want to take it back to where the series began and talk about a pretty disturbing Easter egg that can happen to your player character if you're not careful. If you decide to take the in-game train to visit another player's town, you would be told not to reset your GameCube, and this is pretty crucial, especially since you're not in your own town. But if you do, some interesting results do occur. The game will restart as usual, but when you exit your house, there is no resetting to bitch you out this time. And Instead, the punishment for resetting is much more in your face, literally. Your character is cursed with having a gyroid face now and his three hole face design on your villager is wholly disturbing. The character Coco kind of normalized this look in later games, but even if you catch her on a foggy night, this shit is still kind of creepy to me. The choice of a gyroid face isn't random either as it is a cheeky way to remind players to save any chance they get and not to reset as the person you go to save is a gyroid. I don't think there is any better reminder than cursing the player's face to look like a bowling ball, but that's just me. All right, that'll do it for today. Again, please send me some more suggestions in the comments down below if you have any. I feel like there's still a lot of, uh, of these out there and it's such an interesting topic that covers not only scary things in games, but super nostalgic things I haven't thought of in years. I hope you all enjoyed today's video and if you're new, please subscribe and leave a like down below. I will be planning on doing more of these in the future, so the best way to catch those is to stay subscribed. Anyway, until next time, thanks for watching, guys.